thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, what a joy and what a blessing to have you join us today. I want to talk to you about the man called Larry Stewart. Larry Stewart uh, in a city called Houston, Mississippi. Larry Stewart, it was about this time when he lost his job. He lost his job, had no food to eat. It was a very, very difficult time for Larry Stewart. So Larry Stewart went to a diner called Dixie Diner in Houston, Mississippi. He had no money in his pocket. He was hungry, but he had to eat. So he decided he was going to do something. He was just going to take his wallet, go to Dixie Diner, eat, and then pretend like he forgot his wallet outside. That was his plan because he had, he had lost his job. It was very, very cold. It, he had fallen on some hard times. It was very difficult for Larry Stewart. So he decided to do that. But when he went to uh, Dixie Diner, uh, the owner of Dixie Diner, his name is Ted. Ted was a very generous man, has a very big heart, was very, very magnanimous towards people. He was the owner of the restaurant. So he could look at Larry that, you know, that things were not really going well for Larry, that Larry was going through some challenging moment. So he decided he was going to do something. He went close to where Larry was sitting and then uh, and pretended as though uh, his $20 bill just fell just right where uh, Larry was sitting. So Ted bent down and said, uh oh, it looks like Larry, you dropped your $20 bill. And so he gave it to Larry. So Larry was able to pay for his meal that very day. But little did he know that that one act will go a long way. Well, later on, Larry Stewart started a cable business. He had moved now to Kansas City, Missouri, and while there, he had become a multi-millionaire. But then he made up his mind he was going to pass forward what Ted had done for him. So everywhere Larry goes, he's always giving away $20 bills to people. He wasn't doing it to show off. No, he always goes to where things are rough for them when they are finding it very difficult. He goes there, and later on, he was known as the Secret Santa of Kansas City, Missouri. That's Larry Stewart. So one day, you know, the tabloid decided to out him. They were just going to put his business out there. He was doing it undercover. He didn't want anybody to know what he was doing or who he was. He didn't want any focus or any attention to him. It's just that uh, uh, Ted had shown him kindness, had shown him generosity, and he, and he wanted to pay it back. And everybody he met, he wanted to do the same thing as well for them. So you know what Larry did? Uh, he didn't want the tabloid to out him, so he went to the Dave Ramsey uh, show, and there he unveiled himself. And then finally people found out who Larry Stewart was. But in the past, if you watch any of his video clip, you won't see his face. He told them not to ever show his face. You'll hear his voice, but you'll never see his face. You know why? Because he wanted to make it about other people. Do you know that that $20 bill that Ted gave to Larry today has led to tens of millions of dollars that have been given? As a matter of fact, he drove or flew to New Orleans during the Katrina issue. And he goes to places where things are rough, where there's so much hopeless where people can afford anything and there he passes a hundred dollar bill he started giving out twenty dollar bill but then he graduated from there to giving a hundred dollar bills what am I saying generosity will always beget generosity in Luke chapter 6 verse number 38 in the message Bible here is what it says that what defines life that what defines life look at that give away your life you'll find life given back but not merely giving back giving back with bonus on blessing giving not getting is the way generosity come on help me does what church always begets generosity look at us you and I as Christ followers we 
everyone that is born again, everyone that have given their life to Jesus Christ, we are the biggest recipient of God's generosity toward us. Am I right about that, church? God lavishes generosity on us through the person of Jesus Christ. We are recipient of every good thing in life, our health, our healing, our prosperity, our protection. Everything we enjoy is because of God's generosity. And so, generosity will always give birth to generosity. So, this morning, I want to talk to you about the effects of generosity. What happens when we live a generous life? When we live a, a life of generosity? Now, mind you, generosity is not just about money, but it's also about the use of your time. When you take time to add value to other people, the difference it makes in other people. Because I have been the recipient of generosity, I also want to pay back. I want to, how many of you in this room can say truly that you are a recipient of God's generosity? Anybody? I'm telling you, that's the way I feel. We are all recipients of the goodness of God. So this morning I want to talk about, when I was studying through scripture and praying, look at God, what do I share this morning? I start hearing this word, the effects of generosity. That generosity has an effect. Now, Chick, I sent you a video clip this morning of Larry Stewart. I, I, I wish you could play that video this morning and hear what Larry Stewart says. They won't show his face. This was before he was uncovered and gave his way. It's about two minutes uh, a video clip where how what Larry say, how giving to other people, helping other people, what it does for him. Generosity does something for both the giver and the receiver. That's what I found through scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That the giver is affected and the receiver is affected. Oftentimes we think that the receiver of generosity is the one getting something out of the transaction. But oh no, anybody who is a generous individual will tell you that it has an effect on their own lives as well. Amen. Okay, did you, uh, you got the video clip? Okay, go ahead, play it. gifts a stranger came up and gave you a gift kansas city's secret santa has resurfaced for the holiday season anonymously giving thousands of dollars away to unsuspecting people but as you're about to see in my exclusive interview the gifts he gives go far beyond money of all the gifts you'll give this year will any of them get this kind of reaction Thank you. tears of surprise and joy merry christmas whoever the secret santa is god blessing merry christmas secret santa the anonymous kansas city businessman is back doling out crisp 100 dollars bills to unsuspecting strangers his name stamped on each of them in red ink some people he seeks out because of their enormous need that's 400 secret santa dollars and I hope it makes your Christmas just a little bit better. Okay? It's the first time some say they've smiled in a while. Only the law enforcement officers who travel with them and help him know exactly who he is. Oh, God bless you. Thank you. Mostly, he sets out searching for someone going about their day. He walks by some and knows just when to stop for others. I look on the face and I look for sadness. And when I find sadness, there needs to be hope. And so that's who I usually approach first. This day, he surprises her. Yeah, that's yours. Oh, my God, are you serious? Yeah, I think you dropped it. Oh, my God. You ever heard of Secret Santa? Mm -hmm. Give me a hug, baby. She was able to afford an outfit for her first day of work. And this mother? <laughs> I'm still crying. <laughs> can now afford to bring her son back home for the holidays. Secret Santa, who picked up where his friend, the original covert double S, Larry Stewart, started. He's continued Stewart's legacy since 2007, after Stewart suddenly died. This year, do something special for you and, and your wife and baby. And he's given out $100,000. While the money helps bring a smile to most people because they can now pay bills or put gifts under the tree, there are others. Hey, what's your name? I'm Dana. Whose life story shocks and then sears into his heart. I have four. One's dying. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Dana tells him her oldest 22-year-old, Easton Roberts, is about to die. She's only got a few days left. 
Easton's dying of stage four stomach cancer. She will leave behind a 19 month old. And on top of that, Dana tells Secret Santa she's admitting her third child on this day to Children's Mercy Hospital. Because her third child, an 11 year old, also has stomach cancer. Secret Santa's gift is large. It's $1,000. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. She tells us these dollars will go to the unthinkable for a parent. It will help pay for my daughter's funeral, a lot of things. But in her grief, she says Secret Santa's gift let her see a little hope again. I would encourage everybody to give themselves <laughs> a gift this Christmas. And that's to do random acts of kindness for somebody else because you'll get more back than what you give. These gifts go deep, not from an elf. Secret Santa says elf, in this case, stands for everlasting friend. Dana Gregg, prayers for your family. In November, Secret Santa spent a day in New Jersey and New York giving away thousands to many who had lost everything to Superstorm Sandy. Wow. How did that make you feel? There's another video I sent as well where Larry Stewart talks about giving people th the receiver things, it has more effect on them. He said, No, 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 no. Uh, it's a giving that's a satisfaction I get by helping other people. Uh, are you with me this morning, church? So, two things I want to share with you this morning the effects of generosity the number one effect of generosity is joy that's our theme for this very month of november that there is a joy that comes from giving to other people does anybody know this kind of joy i'm talking about that you are more excited about what the gift is going to do for the receiver right so here is the thing. Here is the wall system. The wall system says uh, the more stuffs you gather, the happier you will be. You know, if you have these, if you have that, if you can gather and acquire a lot more stuff, you will be a much happier individual. That's the culture of the world. The God is calling you and I from that type of mindset or that mind, that way of thinking. We are not to Feet into the culture of gathering stuff. You know, the more stuff we have, you know, the happier we'll be. That's what the world promises us. But you and I know that there are so many people who are rich and have a lot of stuff and are not happy. <laughs> there are a lot of people that they have. People think, oh, the more stuff you gather, the more stuff you have, the happier you will be. No, 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 no. Joy comes from adding value to other people. Can somebody say amen this morning, church? So let, let's look at the, 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 the Passion Translation of Luke 6, 38. Luke 6, 38. Look at what it says. It says, give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you. Shaking together to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. Your measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. Turn. What am I talking about? The more you give out, there's a joy that comes back from you. Am, am, I, am I talking to anybody this morning, church? There's a greater joy that comes by being generous towards other people. Look at the lexicons that the scripture or the vocabulary or the words or the syllables that scripture uses. Such words as ab abound, increase, enlarge, overflowing, surpassing, grace. That tells you something, that every time you get to be a blessing to other people, every time you are generous towards other people, you can be generous and be depressed at the same time. Generous people are joyful people. Can I get them in this morning, church? Generous people are joyful people. See, I was in Abuja. And, uh, and my younger sister said to me, uh, oh, there's a lady in the church here. She's lost her mom, her dad, and, and she's the one taking care of all her siblings. I, I want to give her some food so she could eat. And I said, well, fine. So if you give her food to eat, that's good. You do your part. But then what happens a month later? What happens two months later? Uh, uh, let's do something that will not only change our life temporarily, but at least permanently. Ask her, what does she want to do? What does she want to do with her life? 
Then they said to me, she wants to go to uh, learn how to bake. You know, go learn. It takes 10 months to do that. She can't afford it. She doesn't have the money. I said, well, you go find out what the school is. You go find out what the school is. You let me know. And I want to pay for the 10 months so she can go on to school and be able to help her siblings. Do you know what we, when I told her that? Well, I didn't, I didn't want her to know it was coming from me. And so I, I put my sister forward. She went there. The lady broke down and started crying and weeping. But little did she know that while she's shedding tears of joy, I'm shedding tears of excitement. I'm so excited that I get to be in a position where I can change her life. There is a joy that comes from being generous towards other people. Amen. Joy doesn't just come from getting. Joy comes from what? Just from giving and being a blessing to other people's lives. You know, a true generous person is more excited about what the gift will do for the receiver than, 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 than even uh, the person. Are you with me this morning, church? So, so let's go further. So Jesus is calling us from the culture or the mindset of just getting, of just gathering stuff, of having this or that. So joy doesn't come from just getting. Rather, true joy comes from giving. Open. Here's what I found out. Open. Open-handed people are happier than people who walk around with closed hands. <laughs> when you open up your hands and, and, and you bless other people and you change other people's lives. Look at what Jesus says in Acts chapter 20 verse 35 in God's word translation. Acts chapter 20 verse number 35. He said, I have given you an example that by working hard like this, we should help the weak. We should remember the words that the Lord Jesus said. Giving, gift, is more what church? Satisfying. Come on, help me now. And then what you done? Yeah. Giving gift. There is a level of satisfaction that comes from giving to other people than receiving them. Jesus said, it is more blessed. It is more advantageous. It is more empowering. It is more gratifying. It is more satisfactory to give to other people than receiving. So is there a joy from receiving? Yes, but that joy cannot be compared with the joy of being in a position to do what? To give to other people. Anybody experience that in their life, church? The more you give away, the happier, the more joyful you become in life. Stuffs alone cannot give you true satisfaction and joy. No. So Jesus is inviting the believer. And those of you watching us on streaming live, he's inviting you and I to this lifestyle of generosity during this Christmas period. As we enter into the holiday period, what do we do? We should be looking for opportunities to give away to other people. Oh, your enthusiasm overwhelms me this morning, church. It could be $20. You know what Larry Stewart does? He goes around looking for sad faces. People go, why? Because he once had a very sad face at the store. And somebody st st stood there long enough to pay attention to people. When you go to the grocery store from now to the end of the year, I don't want you to just focus on paying for your own food and walking out. Pay attention to your surrounding because God is going to position somebody around you that is an opportunity for you and I to be generous to us. That's good preaching this morning. Amen. That's a wonderful opportunity. Now, in, in, in Luke, we see this young man called the rich young ruler. You know, he came to Jesus and asked a question. What must I do? It's Mark 10, 17 to 22. What must I do to have eternal life or to have a superior quality of life? The rich young ruler has a lot of money, has a lot of stuff. He was a very wealthy person, but there was something missing in his life. There was a superior or a greater quality of life he was missing out. He wasn't satisfied. He had money. Is it possible for you to have stuff and yet not be happy? Yeah. yeah. 
you have cars, you have everything. You know that America is one of the most blessed countries in the world. But yet, in this country, we have some of the saddest people in the world. Are you hearing me, church? You know, they did a study about uh, the happiest country on earth. They did a study. You know what country came out number one as the happiest uh, country in the world? Nigeria. <laughs> With all the situations and the challenges. But then you go to Western world like, the, like Canada, like, like, like UK or, or, or Sweden or the United States that has so much prosperity. I mean, we have stores that the stores are coming from people's ear. I mean, your garage, your every closet. I mean, thoughts. But yet we have some of the saddest people on planet earth here why because stuff can never give you joy joy comes from being generous to other people come on say amen this morning church you can be generous and be depressed generous people are not depressed people they are not sad because generosity takes the focus off of me and puts the focus on other people you want to experience a life of joy live a life of generosity I'm talking about with your time. I'm talking about with your money. So generosity is not just with money, but it's also with your time. When you take time to be there for somebody, to be a blessing to somebody. This girl in Abuja was crying tears of joy. But she didn't even know that I'm even more excited to see what the gift does to her. I am more excited than she is. Because there's something that is teared up when you become a very, very generous person. One of the things that characterize Christ's followers is generosity. Now, we don't walk around with our hands closed, but we are looking for opportunity to change somebody's life. I know what you're asking. But, Pastor, I don't have money. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm telling you, there is something God has given to you right now that if you release it and share with other people, People, it will not only change their lives, it will also have an effect on your own life as well. So generosity has an effect both on the giver and on who church on the receiver. Can I get them in church? So let's look at the scripture. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now check this out now. He has everything money can offer. He's a very rich man. He has everything. Yet, there was something missing in his life. He was sad. He was not fulfilled. There was no gratification. There was no satisfaction. So he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Go sell everything you have. And give it to the poor. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. I'm not going to go into all of that. But Jesus invites him. Maybe verse number 20, I think. Jesus invites him and says, hey, I want you to take everything you have. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me what was jesus doing jesus was inviting him to come live a life of generosity let's see what happened in verse number 22 does it take the offer verse 22 at this the man's face failed and he went away sad for he had many possessions or shall we put it this way possessions had him how do I know if possession has got a grip on me? How do you know if, if a car is holding you, if money is holding you? When God gives you an instruction and you can let it go, it means that thing has a strong grip on your life. If God tells you, hey, will you give the 20 dollars to this person or be a blessing to this person? And you say, no, 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 no. And you walk around with your hands closed like this. It means the money has a grip on you. One of the ways to break stinginess and self-centered living is to be generous towards other people. Oh, your enthusiasm overwhelms me. Yeah, one of the ways to break, see, money has a grip on people. One of the ways to break the money grip on your life is to give it away. Anything you can.
can't give away has a grip on your life and God wants to be the only one that has a grip on your life nothing else say amen this morning church the Bible said Jesus said to the man hey come live a life of generosity it was an invitation to the man to come live a life of joy but the Bible said he went away sad why because he was not willing to part with what he had so this month we're talking about joy well the the best way to live a life that is filled with joy is to do what church give away what you have Amen. and do you know whenever we hear the word of god god is going to bring opportunity you know think about you know what is happening right now in america you know uh, people losing jobs people going through tough times i think we as a church you and i should be thinking who, who among us here, who in our congregation here, that, that maybe they've lost a job, there are opportunities for us to be generous towards them. Can I get an amen this morning, church? Let's look around the congregation. Let's look around people. Not just congregation, but your neighbor, the, the apartment you live, the subdivision where you live, where you live, somewhere, somehow, there is somebody home, $20 will go a long way for them will put a smile on their face, will change their life, will remind them that God loves them, God has not abandoned them, God cares for them. Are you hearing me this morning, church? You know, the lady in Nigeria, her name is Dawkers. Dawkers said that during the, the five days program I went to, she kept praying all throughout, oh God, locate me. That was her prayer. God, locate me. God, locate me. She had no money to come to church. She walks to church every day. She never begs nobody. But during this program, she begged her neighbor to give her money to come and when she came my sister said during praise worship service her eyes caught this girl that's that's dark as well. this is her uniform in the new school right now she's learning how to bake and then we'll start her own business as well come on now say amen this morning church that's that's Dorcas. no mother no father she shared that testimony this morning in our church in abuja she's enrolled in the school this is the uniform and, and i said no don't worry when you finish the school the same god who made it possible for you to go through the school the same god will provide all the baking equipment that you need to be able to start out your own business amen i couldn't pass this opportunity when they told me her story i couldn't pass that out so this is a great opportunity for me it was a privilege for me to be in a position where i could change Docker's life amen and this morning among us here and on on our social media you know there are people there are people around everywhere that that are going through this tough time right now job loss and and economically uh, depressed times people going through one thing or the other but if we open up our eyes child of god there is a joy that that we get by being a blessing to other people let me share with you what paul says uh, in second corinthians chapter 9. you know paul was writing to the church because there was such a farming and a very tough time in the church in jerusalem and so paul was taking offerings and 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 challenging people to give so there will be resources available to help the church in jerusalem and when i saw this reading through this it so blessed me this is what really gave birth to this message i was just the spirit of god picking my hand and said hey, go back to second corinthians read the whole chapter i did but from from verse 10 till 15 really captured my heart this is what really got a grip on me this is where i found out that, that generosity does something more to the giver than to the receiver that when you are generous generosity has a win-win situation so here's what it says this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer which becomes bread for our meals is even more extravagant toward you first he supplies every need can you attest the fact that God has generously supplied every need in your life come on let's celebrate God this morning for being so generous toward us hallelujah come on anybody appreciate God's generosity toward you in spite of the challenges God has been generous with coronavirus from the beginning of this year God has supplied every 
every need in our lives extravagant generosity the bible tells us look at that it's even more extravagant toward you first he supplies every need not just supply every need, plus more then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will do what church so paul is talking about that when you are generous he takes the seed you sow and he multiplies it back to you if you sow a thousand, if you sow five hundred, if you sow a hundred, he takes that money and he multiplies it back to you. Does anybody have a testimony in this area? How as a result of your giving, he took the seed you sow, maybe it's your tithe, maybe it's an offering, but he multiplied it back to you. I hear stories in our church pastor oh I sold him this person I gave during for the end of the year giving I did this I did that oh by the way I'm in Nigeria you know I made a commitment to sow a thousand dollars I gave 600 before I left and I said when I come back I'm going to give um, the remaining one so I've written it out to pay my end of year giving but while I'm in Nigeria while I am in Nigeria I've not even finished paying all my money all my value yet God my wife called me in Nigeria and say pastor somebody in the church sold two thousand dollars in your life and in my life Look, I've not even accessed the check yet somebody God I'm in Africa doing you know just doing my thing obeying God but then God is placing me on somebody's heart who is thinking about me so I want to be a blessing to him and then the person so two thousand dollars in my wife and I, I don't know but two that's an increase that's multiplication remember we said before the year is out get ready for supernatural increase in your finances come on are you hearing me in our church amen Get ready for increase, you say. So God takes what we have and it does what? He multiplies it. Anything that leaves you doesn't come back the way it left you. Whatever leaves you comes back, but it comes back even way much better. So the Bible says you will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. For when we take your gifts to those in need, Look at the next word. It causes many to do a church. <laughs> so number one, we say that generosity brings what church? Joy. I, am I right about that church? That when you are generous, generous people are joyful people. They are joyful people. But then he says, not only that's for the giver, but then he says on the side of the receiver, that generosity causes people to give thanks to God. <laughs> you mean when I give, when I help other people, when I'm a blessing to other people, it causes those people to begin to do what church, to begin to worship God, to begin to praise God, to begin to give God. In other words, generosity produces glory to God. Woo! Let's go further. Let's go further. The priestly ministry you are providing through your offering not only supplies what is lacking for God's people, it inspires an outpouring of praises. And here is the word again. And watch out. And thanks given to God. So when you give, when you give, it says it supply, it meets a need. When I was in Africa, and when I get, you know, there are some things I'm praying for. There are some things I'm praying for. I, you know, so I'm praying and I'm in faith for my finances. So, so when, when I was there, God places my wife and I on somebody's heart, and they remembered us, and they saw two thousand dollars in our life. What does that mean? That's meeting a need in our lives. As a result of meeting that very needs, guess what we're doing? We are thanking God. We are saying, God, thank you so much for, for, for your generosity, for supplying, for providing everything. If you want to produce glory and thanksgiving during this period of the year, how do we do that? We help other people. Am I helping anybody this morning, church? So, 
to God. So let's go further. Verse number 13. For us, your, ex uh, for us, your extremely generous offering meets the approval of those in Jerusalem. It will cause them to give glory to God. All because of your loyal support and allegiance to the gospel of Christ as well as your generous hearted partnership with them toward those in need verse number 14 says because of this extraordinary grace which God has lavished on you they will affectionately remember you in what church in their in their prayers because when people so through when people saw in Allah, we pray for the whole church. But when somebody saw in Allah, I said, God, whatever is the reason why, whatever need they have, wherever they need to see a harvest, I pray that the seed they've sown in my life will speak for them in all the places that matters to their interest. Lord, wherever they need a harvest in, I am praying for them that the seed the sown will speak for them, will represent, because your seed has a voice. I'm telling you, when you sow a seed, your seed has what church are. You know why I say your seed has a voice? Because in Acts chapter 10, the Bible tells us that an angel appeared to Cornelius and said to him, your giving has come up to God. Your giving is, has come up. Your generosity in Acts chapter 10. So your generosity has come up to God and is speaking on your behalf before God. Yeah. Even though you are a Gentile, you are not supposed to be a partaker of this salvation but because of your seed but because of your giving but because of your generosity your generosity is speaking on your behalf do you know that when you sow when you give in the boardroom your seed will speak for you when they gather to say she needs to quit we're going to fire her we're going to set her up your seed will rise up in the boardroom and call somebody to defend you you are not hearing me this morning church so every time you put a seed in the ground every time you sow a seed your seed has a voice the angel say I have come because of your seed it's two things your prayers and your seed you prayed but then you sow the seed and so as a result of that i'm here because of your prayers and your seed angels are activated every time i put a seed in the ground every time i pay my tithe every time I, i'm a blessing to somebody else angels of harvest are activated and they go to the north to the west to the south and they bring the harvest come on say amen and say Cornelius your prayer is heard and your arms are hard in remembrance in the sight of God may I share with you this you know how in the world out there is a, it's, it's a very very terrible place out there where people plan your demise and, and they want you to lose your job and they want to set you up for failure they want to do this they want to do this for you and guess what even though you are not there your seed will raise somebody in the boardroom who will fight for you who will defend your cause and say this cannot happen am i am i talking to anybody this morning church not only that your seed will touch people's heart and say she's due for a promotion he's due for a promotion they need to have an increase can i get an amen this morning church amen shout amen, amen. my friend was telling me uh, Dr. Adebi came to see me in Abuja. We spent quite some time together. And he told me how he used to be an immigration officer, the Nigerian immigration officer. And, uh, and so, as the, the passport officer for his location, you know, they don't allow immigration officers to be the passport officer for more than six months. Because they believe that by six months, you should have made it. Because of the opportunities that are available. Because somebody can come and buy a Nigerian passport for 100 million naira. I mean, that set you up. But my friend is a person of integrity. He will not let them do that. And this is the way it is. Uh, so they want him removed because it's blocking them from making money. 
So some of you in America may not relate to what I'm about to tell you. So here's what they did. So three of the officers under him, they went to a witch doctor. And, and they took his heart to the witch doctor and walked voodoo on it. The mindset is that the moment he comes to the office on Monday, now this happened on Friday. I said when he comes to work on Monday and it and he takes the first heart and put it on, he will become mad. He will lose his mind. You know, there are wicked people everywhere. But this man is a giver. This man is a lover of God. This man is a follower of Jesus. So you don't mess up with such a person. You don't mess up with a covenant man or a covenant woman who has a walk with God. If you try, it will backfire on the person. So check, 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 check this out. So there were three hearts. So he goes to work on Monday. He goes to work on Monday and he takes the first heart. And he put it on. And then he put it back. He comes back to work on Tuesday. Takes the force out, put it on, put it back. On Wednesday, when he came to the office, there was a man waiting for him there. So when he grabbed the third heart to put it on, the guy held his head and said, you can't put this on. You can't put this on. He said, I'm feeling heat on my head already just by you grabbing this. And he said, why? He said, please, 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 sit down. Put the heart far away. Don't put it on your head. Let me tell you what happened. He said, see, when we went to the witch doctor, the first person who entered into the chamber, see, there are three of us. I was number three. The first person who walked into the chamber of the witch doctor, the moment you took your heart and you put it on, on your head, they became mad out there on the street. They lost their mind. <laughs> And he said, the second day, the, 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 the second person who entered into the witch doctor's chamber also lost his mind. And I am I am the third person to enter. So you cannot, he said, please forgive me, pray for me. <laughs> Folks, we serve such an awesome God. As if that's not enough. He said with me again about how, as a passport officer, if one booklet is missing, you go to jail. So another group of people started to set him up again there. So they, they walked all this. They took the, about five passports. That means he's going to go to jail for life. So he came to the office on Monday morning. And when he got there, there was a guy there who froze like this in one spot. He's, he's holding the passport with one hand, but he cannot move. He remained there till pa my friend came, prayed over him, and then released him. Wow. We sobs. <laughs> you don't play with a man or a woman that has a prayer life and that has a heart of generosity. Whether you are there, whether you are not there, your seed will speak for you in absence. It doesn't matter what weapon that is formed. It doesn't matter your walk with God, your relationship with God, your prayer life, and your heart of generosity. Your seed will rise up as a form of warfare against the adversary of your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. That's God's word. You don't mess up with a covenant man or a covenant woman. You don't mess up with them. You know, some of you in America, this looks kind of far-fetched. You say, I don't believe that. It, don't, it really doesn't make any difference. The fact of the matter is this, Satan is real, but more real is the power of God. So we are not afraid. We are not afraid of the demonic world, of the demonic spirit. You know why? Because the greater one is living big on the inside of us. Yeah. Clap your hands, somebody, and praise him this morning, church. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. So anytime you give, anytime you help somebody else, you know what? For me, it was joy. But for Dockers, put the latest picture again. For Dockers, it's Thanksgiving. She's, she's thanking God. She's praising God. She's giving God the glory. She's rejoicing. She, you know, her life has completely changed. She's thanking God. But well, that's what happened. The receiver breaks out with what church? Thanksgiving. How many of you?
of you, you prayed for something and God used somebody to meet that very need. How do you respond? Oh God, thank you. Oh God, I'm grateful. Oh God, anybody know what I'm talking about, church? You break out in worship when God comes through for you, when God uses a man or a woman to be a blessing in your life, the outcome of generosity is what church? Thanksgiving. So number one, the effects of thanksgiving is what church? Joy. Joy. And number two, the effects of thanksgiving is what church? No, the effects of generosity is what church? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You know, God, use somebody to meet a need in your life. God, use somebody to come through for you. And I don't know why. This trip I was about to go to Nigeria last time, I don't know how this thing happened. You know? When we were coming to morning dew, you know, I, I would say, oh God, I don't have all the money for my trip, but you know, I don't have to worry because you have always supplied everything. You've, I've been working with God long enough to know that I, I don't have to stress about that, that he has ways to, to come through and meet needs. And so I, I needed some extra money. But this the last morning dew of this month i don't know i went to the closet and there's this blazer i've not worn for a long time as well i've not even worn it this year so i had an it, it, something me wear that blazer today so i just i say you know what yeah i'm gonna wear that blazer that has checkers on it today blue checkers on it today i, I just feel like coming to church like that and then I come to church on that morning and church is over and I go home and, and I'm about to take off the, the, the blazer. I felt the paper in, my, in the pocket. And I'm saying, what in the world is this? So I went there and inside was almost a thousand one hundred dollar bill inside. How did you think I felt? <laughs> I was so excited. I said, God, look, that thing meant, I said, God, you are always looking out for your boy. You got my back. You are, anybody ever felt like that before? Well, you know that this has to be God. Of all the blazers I have, I mean, if you come to my house, I, I, I'm using my son's closet, I'm using my closet, I'm using my wife's closet, I'm using all the guest closet for my clothes because you know how American homes are? They just give a little tiny closet to the man because they don't expect him to have more than two suits. And I said, God, look, if you see the way I felt, God, you are always looking out for me. You know, you got my back. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm worshiping God. I'm praising God. I'm giving God the glory. Come on. Can I say amen this morning, church? When I was, when I was, I was in Lagos last night, and, and uh, I was supposed to come back on economic comfort. So we'll come back on economic comfort. But I said, there's nothing comfortable about economy. You know, I'm going to be preaching this morning. I said, Lord, it'd be good if you let your boy go home on a business class. <laughs> I said, God, could you hook me up? Could you help your boy out? I said, because if I get to sleep and I come to church energized, fired up, ready to go to preach. But if I stay in the economy, I'll be all crushed up like this till morning. God, please help me. So they said, well, you have to go to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the office. I went there. He said, well, if you want to fly business class, I've already gotten my ticket now. He said, I have to pay additional $2,000. I called home, I thought I called Pastor Edith, the phone rang, 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 rang. I was looking for encouragement, whether should I go for it or shouldn't I go. Then I called my wife, my wife said, yeah, that's too much, honey. I said, that was, okay, I can go back. So I said, God, I need you to help your boy out, help me out. And then the lady said, well, don't pay $2,000, show me another way to be able to come on business class without me paying a dime. Folks, look, it, when, when you were waking up this morning, me too, I was just waking up on the aircraft. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, when you were waking up, I woke up at about, I woke up about three hours before we landed. And I stood up and I said, 
I mean, I mean, because the bad, I mean, the chair turns right into a bed. They give you the food is better. I mean, the blanket is thicker. You just say whatever you need. And Mr. Mama, can I help you? Well, no, no, no. Let me chill for now. I, I, I'm coming to you. Look, I woke up this morning strong and ready to go. That's God looking up for me. That's the, f that's the God you saw. How do you think I felt once I got on the aircraft? God, I can't thank you enough. I began to worship God. I began to praise God. I began to celebrate God. I, even when we landed at 5.30 this morning at the airport, I was still thanking God. I was still praising God, giving God the glory. Can I get an amen this morning, church? So generosity brings about worship. It brings about thanksgiving. It brings about celebrating God. If you want people to thank God, then God wants to use you to meet that very need. Amen. In Philippians chapter 1, this is what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 3 through 5 in the New Living Translation. He said, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Just, just, just pause there for a moment. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. So every time I remember you, every time I think about you, what do I do? I give thanks. Do you know that there are certain people that God has placed in your life that the thought of them breeds thanksgiving? The question is, who is thanking God because of you? Why was Paul giving thanks to God? Because of their generosity. They gave to Paul. They sold him Paul. They stood with Paul. They partnered with Paul. In verse number 4 of, of Philippians chapter 1 verse number 4. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. Then verse number 5 says, why? For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Paul said, you, you partner with me. You stood with me. You give to my personal needs. And you give to the cause of that I came. To, you help me to spread the gospel. Do you know every member of our church? You are not just a member. You know there are certain people in our church that we call them partners. We pray for partners. I set a day out of the week just to pray for partners. Who are partners in Overcomers? Partners are people who are serving. Dream team members. They are involved. They help us to make ministry easy. You know, last Sunday I wasn't here but I was told brother Larry used his gift and preached such a, a powerful word and everyone I spoke to say oh he did a great job oh, anybody blessed last Sunday because of his ministry he used his gift to do what to spread the gospel to help other people that's a partner. Partners are those who are involved. They are serving. Partners don't just come to church and go home. No, 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 no. Partners say, look here, God has been too good to me. I have something to offer. I've got gifts. Everything that God has given to me is for the furtherance, is for the advancement, is for the promotion of the gospel, is to help connect people to the partners. Uh, they come to church, but they don't just come to church, but they are involved in the church. They are plugged in. They are dream team members. So who is a partner? Partner are those who are serving. Partner are those who pay tithe, who give. Those who, those who, who give in support of the work. You know, you are my partner. And I pray for you every day. I pray. And that's why in, in Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6, this prayer is for Paul's partners. He said to them, for, 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 for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Paul said, the moment you give your life to Jesus, you became a partner. Come and help me ask your neighbor, are you a partner? <laughs> well, tell them then, if you are, tell them, yes, I am. <laughs> but make sure you are, though. <laughs> Partners are those who serve in the children's ministry, on the worship team. Partners are those who serve on the parking lot. Partners are men and women who use every gift that God has given to them to promote Jesus. Partners are people who say, every gift God has given to me is not just for me to profit or to pay bills, but everything 
thing is given me, I will use it to spread and preach the gospel. Here is Paul's prayer for them. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So Paul said, because of your partnership, whatever God began in your life will not be abandoned, but he will finish whatever he began in your life. Come on, I want to let you know God has begun something in your life already and he will not stop until he finishes what has begun in your life. He's begun something in your life. God has started a work in your life and he will not quit until you, he finishes what is begun in your life. If he has started healing you, he will not finish till the entire healing process is completed. Am I, can I get an amen, church? If he starts anything, it's because he has already finished it. You know, people always quote Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all oh. and and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus this is not for everybody the Corinthian church cannot claim this scripture the church in Thessalonica the church in Ephesus, the church in Colossae, many of the churches Paul started, they can't have access to this very scripture. You know why? Because they never partnered with Paul. People, everybody claim, my God supplies all my needs. Yeah, but are you a partner? Are you doing everything you can to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you a gospel promoter? For us to understand this place here, if you go to verse number 14 of the same thing, Philippians chapter 4, from verse number 14, downwards, notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning what church giving and receive him. In other words, he said, no church, all the churches I planted, not a single one of them partner with me in my affliction. When I was in jail, when I was abandoned, when I had a need, nobody stood with me and partner with me. But you did that. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning, nobody did that. He said, but you only. Then verse number 16, he says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Verse number 18, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an order of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Because of that, but my God, come on, somebody say, my God. Paul is now praying for the church in Macedonia, in Philippi, that because of your partnership, God will support supply every need in your life. Can I get an amen this morning, church? As a matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 1, you know what Paul said to them? He said, you are partakers of my grace. I think it's Philippians chapter 1, verse number 7. He said, you are partakers of the grace that I am carrying. In other words, when God called me into the office of an apostle, there was a grace that was released for me to function in the office of an apostle. Paul is saying, he said, because of that, for even as it is meant for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are what church? Partakers of my grace. What does it mean to be a partaker? Another word for partaker is participator. Another word is partnership. What does it mean to partake in the grace of a man of God? What, what does that mean? Folks, to understand this, see, even if nothing is working for you, if you hook up with a man that has grace on their lives, the grace on their lives will produce result in your life. Your amen is not born again. Come on, somebody. We look at the Old Testament pattern. We look at the Old Testament pattern. God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 
uh, uh, 12. He said, Abraham, is it chapter 12? He said, get out from your father's house. I want to take you to a land, you know, that, that is this and this and this and this and this and this. I will make you a great nation. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do that for you. When Abraham packed his stuff and decided to leave, Lot also followed him. In chapter 12, verse uh, uh, 4, Abraham said, well, I, I, I don't have any revelation, but I have enough sense to hook up with somebody that has revelation. I don't have revelation, I have association. In other words, Lord became blessed because of his association. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him. And Lord went with him. And Lord went with him. And Lord went with him. Well, let's see what grace did for him. In Genesis chapter 13, from verse number 1, the next chapter, the Bible says, Abraham had flocks. Abraham had gold. Abraham had silver. Abraham has all this. And at the end of the day, the Bible says, and Lord also which went with him and Abraham was rich in cattle in silver and in gold and the Bible says, and Lot also so whatever God did for Abraham guess what church <laughs> you are not hearing me this morning church whatever God said Lot was not there Lot didn't have revelation but he said I'm going to hook with a man that has revelation and whatever God said to that man I'm a participator I'm a partaker of the grace upon their life can somebody shout amen, amen. may I share with you one of the grace that we enjoy in this ministry one of the grace we enjoy here this church is 23 years in every recession in every hard time we have never had to beg in this church God has always supplied. You have never heard us come to say, oh, we can't pay the light bill. Oh, we can't pay the mortgage. Oh, they are going to cut off the light. That has never happened in 23 years. So when you become a partaker and you are a partner of this ministry, you access that grace that never again will anything be disconnected in your house for lack of resources. You are watching me like you don't even know what I'm talking about this morning, church. Here is another grace we enjoy in this ministry. We started in my living room. You know, I've been watching the trajectory of God's goodness in our lives. We have never gone back. It's always been consistent progress. Every time we got a building, it was always better than where we came from. We started in my living room. We moved to 813. 813 was bigger, can accommodate more than my living room, 615. Then we went to 6751. 67151 was better than 813. Then we got there. Then it, it became too small for us. Then we moved to 7373. 7, so it's been from glory to glory. It's been from one dimension to another. So when you are a, a partner of this house here you know what happened to you you cannot retrogress you cannot go back but you keep moving forward in your life you go from glory to glory you go from one dimension to another who am i talking to this morning church i'm not stressed out for ministry i'm not stressed out even during the 2008 pandemic with no luck when people are laying people off we are still paying our staff salary. That's God. Not only are we giving them salary, but we're giving them a raise, promotion. But that's also you too. When you are a partaker of this grace. Paul said to the church of Philippa, you are partakers of my grace. Because I can never break down, you too can never break down. Because I have no luck, you too, you have no luck. The devil can kill me, he can kill you. The devil can stop us, he can stop you. Can I get it in this morning, church? Hallelujah. So when you become a part of a ministry, you've got to learn how to key into the grace that is upon that very ministry. You know, one of the things in our, in our overcomers is that for 23 years now, we have never lacked help. God has always provided us with help. Whenever we have any vision, 
in overcomers Christian fellow. When we set our hearts, we're going to do something. Regardless of what the prize is, we always, that vision always comes to pass. God always brings the pro in front or, or, or in, at the back of our vision. He always provides. Well, you too, do you have a vision for your family, for your business, for your health? I want you to get excited because the same God that has supernaturally provided for the vision of this house, your vision will not die. Your vision will speak. Hallelujah. Come on, shout a loud amen. amen. So Paul said to the church at Corinth, you are partakers of my grace. You're partakers of my grace. Whatever God does for me, get ready. He will do the same thing for you as well. That's why there's no need for any jealousy because when God raises one person, we are all going up as well. Can I get it in this morning, church? I don't care about what the pandemic says. You will never break down. You will not have any lack in your life on streaming live. And in this very room here, it doesn't matter what the scientists say about the coronavirus. I want you to know that we have a covenant of protection from God. We are covered. We are protected. We are shielded. I, I wish somebody would get a loud amen this morning, church. We are protected by God. And we are not begging anybody. Whatever need you have, God is going to raise people. Amen. Come on, I said God is going to raise people here. Amen. God has always raised people to help me. I was, uh, I, I went to preach in uh, Brooklyn. And when I was preaching in Brooklyn, uh, one of the guys, they put me, they, they had a hotel for me called Holiday Inn. And I'm fine, I'll go rest there and then go preach. But one of the guys came to me and said, you know what? I don't want you to stay in Holiday Inn. I said, eh. He said, yes. <laughs> I said, okay, where do you want me to stay? So I wanted to go to Waldorf Astoria. Oh. <laughs> Waldorf. Folks, the closest, not just me, you two, the closest we got to is coming to America. That's the only place I saw Waldorf Astoria. And so he said, no, you're going to stay there. I said, sure, I'm a very humble, obedient servant. I will go over there. <laughs> then the, the driver who picks me for church said, well, Manhattan is very far to Brooklyn. Traffic and all those things. You know what I said to them? No weapon formed against Waldorf Astoria. Well, I've come too far. And I, have a, I refuse to be refused. I deny to be denied. I don't care what the traffic is, I will stay there. So my wife and I, we went there. We stayed at Waldorf Astoria, and they come to pick us up every day. Wow. And then the guy came to me one time and said, Pastor, you know, I was driving a Sequoia. He said, Pastor, I don't, I'm, I've been wondering why I'm driving a, a, a Range Rover Sport, and you are in the Sequoia. I said, me too. I've been wondering the same thing. <laughs> He said, no, I shouldn't be driving a car like that and, 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 and you in a sequoia. I said, oh, yeah, take me. <laughs> the next day, and I never prayed. I never asked God for it. I never prayed. But see, there's a way you can walk with God. That there are certain things you don't have to say. You get to the level of desire. You, oh. You can consistently walk with God. That you get to a place over without even saying it. You just desire it and God will raise somebody to meet that. I pray that God will usher you into that very realm whereby you should desire it. It will come to pass. Come on, shout amen. amen. Some of you remember that in the old church. And I drove to church with my happy sequoia, loving Jesus. And... And, 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 and they gave me a brand new key to the car. And, and that's God. And I developed, I was, they were coming to pick me in Range Rover Sport in, in Manhattan. And I said, wow, this is really nice. I wouldn't mind having one of these one day. That was it. The moment the word left, that word began to speak. Come on, that word began to attract help us. 
Can I get an amen this morning, church? I pray for you in this church and those of you on streaming live that the same grace that has worked for me for the past 23 years in this ministry, that grace is activated in your life in the name of Jesus. Come on, I need a better amen than that, church. Shout hallelujah.